Okay, so what we're going to talk about today. Firstly, some basics about web fonts. Secondly, open type features and CSS. Thirdly, color fonts. And lastly, variable fonts. You've already heard mention of variable fonts. If you don't know what they are, you will by the time I'm done. So I, I really, I mean, everyone, so everyone here uses web fonts, right, on your projects. You already use them already, yes? Yeah. Yes? Okay, good, good. Do you use them to their full extent? Do you use everything that they can do? Do you use all the features that you could use in print on the web? Probably not. I'm going to show you how you can do that. So let's start with some basics. Why is that backwards, by the way? Does anyone know why the Helvetica is backwards? Because, yeah, yes, that's right, that's right. That's where you put the ink on and it comes out the right way. So, what is a character? People know what characters are. Do you know what a character is? It's a number. It has some properties like, is this an uppercase letter, is this a numeral, but it's basically a number. Whereas the thing that you actually look at is called a glyph, and that is the visual representation. People often mix these up, characters and glyphs. Fonts are collections of glyphs. So good, now this is the real basics. A test, now there will be questions. So what is that, what are we looking at? Is that a character or a glyph? Yes. How many characters is it? Two, good. How many glyphs? One, excellent. What about here? How many characters? Any other answers? Good, both questions are correct. Yes, it could be one if it's precomposed or, not, or two if it's not. It's one glyph and it could be one or possibly two fonts. And if it's two fonts, then it will look really ugly and you don't want to ever do that. Okay, some more terminology. Myriad Pro I've got there, that is a font family. And then we've got several different faces in that family. Light, Roman, bold, condensed, etc. They're all in the same family. And similarly, there's Baskerville and it has some faces as well. So good, we've got some basic terminology down. We're all talking about the same thing. Now look, look at this, what have we got here? We've got a font weight bold and we've got a font weight bold. Why is it there twice? What's the difference? One is a font face, that's correct, but so is that the same property twice? No, one of them is a descriptor and one of them is a property. In the at font face, you, what you're doing is you're saying this font has the following properties. It has these, these characteristics. So you're saying this font does bold. Whereas in the H1, you're saying I want this styled using a font that can do bold. That's different. One is a request for styling, one is a description of the capabilities. So there we are, descriptors and properties. Okay, good, we're almost done with the basics. Yes, in fact, we are done with the basics. I cut out some basics that were not as basic. <coughs> okay, so open type features and CSS. So this is where, I mean, we, we've got the basic, yeah, I've, I've got this font, I've downloaded it, it's used on the website, great. Um, what about doing stuff like that, which is a bit more interesting? You can see we've got some little, you know, fancy ligatures there and some, some swash forms and interesting stuff going on. So, open type features are stylistic controls, typically optional, not always, for some languages they're actually required to display the language, but they're in the font. And then the idea is that you control them with CSS. Obviously, you want control over the typography in your style sheet, not buried in the font somewhere. Um, throughout this talk, I'm going to be using the font variant property, which is preferred, it's readable. Um, I'm also having to give this talk in Firefox because that's the only browser that I've found so far that supports it properly. Do. Then there's also font feature settings, which are in all the browsers, and they're horrible little cryptic four-letter things like buh, 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 and it's like, what? What is that? What does that do? So don't use those. Actually, you will have to use them. If you're going to polyfill them or do something, you could probably have to use them for now. But every time I mention this, that there's only one browser doing it, I just hope the other ones have sufficient shame that they get their act together and start implementing what people actually want. So here's an example of a feature. Um, if you look, we've got some uppercase text and some lowercase text, and you notice that the numbers in the uppercase, they match well, and on the lowercase, well, lowercase letters have ascenders and descenders, but these, these letters don't, these numbers don't. But with a single property, we can change that to old style numbers, and then suddenly, the, the numerals have upper and lower case forms and they, they fit much more nicely. Oh, you wouldn't do it like this, obviously. I'm just showing you. If, it was, if your title was in upper case, you would use one value, and if your, if your text was in lower case, you'd use the other one. You would do it as appropriately. But that's just one, one property, very easy to add, simple thing to add to your style sheet. So here's another one, fractions. Lots of fonts will have a fraction. They will say, yeah, I've got a half, I've got a three quarters. But if you want an 86, 483rds, yeah, you're going to be out of luck there. 
But just by setting them like this, and the, the other thing is if you actually put three quarters as like the Unicode character, someone's searching for three quarters, three slash four in Google, they're not going to find it, right? It's a different set of characters. So if you do it like this, and then you set font varying numeric to diagonal fractions, boo, suddenly we get nice looking fractions with the numbers all scaled down and shifted and it, it all looks beautiful. And again, very simple, just one single property. Here's another example. We're looking at these tables of numbers there, and well, let's find the biggest one. Well, this one starting with eight, that's probably bigger than the other ones, right? Because they start with one and two. Actually, no, because if you look, that has less numbers, it has less digits. And now you could get around that by just setting that using a monospace font, but that would look super ugly. So what you actually want is to have a proportional font where all the text is proportional, but the numbers all take up the same width, which is a principle called tabular numbers. Ding, suddenly they all line up nicely. And lastly, the thing I started with were these interesting ligatures. So there is ligatures normal, which is just the ordinary ones. Now let's switch on discretionary ligatures, and we get the LE going like that, and a nice swoosh R with the O underneath it, and that sort of thing. So that's nice. You would probably not want to do that on body text, but for a heading, it looked pretty good. And then none. Notice that the F and the L are now colliding. So you've to you forced the font to not do the ligatures, including the ones that it really needs to do. Don't ever use this value. It's only useful for testing. Now, a thing you're probably aware of is that the browsers will tend to fake up for you. You, you download a single font, and then you ask for bold and italic. These ca can't be created out of thin air. But what it can do is it can kind of slant the letters and pretend that they're italic, they're obliqued, which is really ugly, actually. Um, it look, works better in some than others. So here we have a font, and it has Roman and italic and bold. And this font synthesis property says which ones it's allowed to fake. So let's switch that to none. OK, we already did have a bold, but the italic was just made in the browser. This is much better if you, sometimes you don't want the ugly version, and you would rather it just, you could use a different color as well, something like that. And we can look at different font families and see what they have by way of, yeah, you can see that one's just got a single value in the font family, but if I set style, there we go, there's the, it's italic, the italic, isn't, could that, could that be any worse, actually? Um, and the weight, okay, now it's made the bold. So really, this is for switching off a feature which the browser is doing for you. And then lastly, kerning. Now, be, people know what kerning means? Yes? Good. Yes? Okay, good, good. And how is that different from letter spacing, do you know? Yes, good, correct. So the kerning is about particular pairs of characters and how they fit together so that they look nicely done, as letter spacing is applied to all of the characters uniformly. So there's font kerning. You can tell this one's designed by the CSS Working Group because the default is auto, and then it has normal and none, and you're like, what, which? Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> and normal isn't the initial value, right? But let's set it to normal, and nothing happens. Because, so why does nothing happen? Oh, okay, nothing happened because I didn't actually manage to select it. That is also true, but still nothing happened. Um, why is that? So what this means is that this particular browser has kerning on by default. So when I switched it to normal, then with normal means do what the font says, and the browser isn't always doing what the font says. In some browsers, though, switching it to normal would result in kerning being applied. If a browser like Chrome, for example, is more concerned about performance than it is concerned about looks, then it will switch kerning off by default. So this is a handy property to use, because you can normalize results across browsers. You can say for this text, I want all the browsers to do kerning. Just set font kerning to normal, and they will all do it. And then, of course, you can also set it to none, which means wuh. Now we have really ugly, the W and the A look just terrible. And let's compare that to letter spacing, which is how you spread everything out, or reduce it, or, yeah, don't ever do that. Um, okay. Now, color fonts. What we see here is a piece of cloth with some sign writing on it. It's from India. Um, 
there was a chap who was going around India and he was looking at all this amazing signage that is actually hand-painted for you know, fruit stalls and this sort of thing. And he thought, this is great, and these people are going out of business because it's a traditional, it's labor-intensive, it's being replaced by sort of vinyl printers and print shops. So he said to these guys, I want you to design fonts for me. And they're like, yeah, but we don't have a computer. He said, that's fine. Just design me the font, let me see it, and I will do all, all the computer stuff. So they deliver in bolts of cloth with these gorgeous multicolored things painted all over them. And they're like, there, letters. Yeah, but we can't do that. Well, we can now, but we couldn't at the time. So why do we actually want color fonts anyway? Well, as you can see, illuminated manuscripts in medieval times had multiple colors. They had red, they had letters with you know, decoration and multiple colors, and people have missed this for so long. There's been such a desire from the web community to be able to do illuminated manuscripts once again. Uh, okay, that's, that's not the reason. This is the reason, actually. Um, this is why we have colored fonts suddenly when they've been wanted for ages, but now we have emojis, so that's cool. Um, uh, but yeah, likewise, this have to be in color, pretty much. So let's go back to this one. Uh, here's an example, there we are, see? It's on my screen, it's in multiple colors, doesn't it look great? Does it look great? Yes. Does it still look great? If I view the source, does it look great? Oh my god. Think what that is going to do for your search engine optimization. You've got the same text nine times. Whoa, long, fail. No, that's not going to work. This is fine in print. No one knows that you aligned all these in Illustrator and then just lined them up and went bang, and out, out came your printed output. On the web, not so much. But there are, so now in the, the second last version of OpenType, there are ways of doing color fonts. Some of them are sucky, frankly. Um, thank you, Apple and Google, for your bitmapped fonts, which basically we're trying to get away from those for ages. Please do not bring them back. On the other hand, there are two versions that I'm going to tell you about, which are vector fonts, which are still colored, and they're vector fonts. So the first one is using color and CPAL. Color holds a stack of true type outlines, and CPAL holds the palettes, which gives you this. You probably don't believe me that that's actually being displayed live in the browser, so I'm just going to delete that and go. There we go. And it, never mind CVSS, that's the next version of CSS. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's CSS with variables. OK, good. So we have that, so that works. Now, that's good, but it's a stack of outlines, OK? They, you can't have gradients, you can't have anything fancy like that. And it, it's fine, but where did the styling go? This is not cool at all. The colors are in the font. We don't want them in the font, we want them in our style sheet. So, SVG. Not SVG fonts, right? Nobody uses SVG fonts now, I hope. OK, but SVG in OpenType, which also uses CPAL, the SVG table in the OpenType font has the SVG graphic, the PAL has the palettes, and you use CSS variables to alter the palette. So this is actually, again, live. This is an SVG in OpenType font, which, again, I can type. Good, so these are live fonts. And here's an example here. These, these uh, variable names are predefined. They're actually in the open type spec. And you can specify them and then start changing the colors like that. Woo, there we go. So that's one way to do it. It's actually not a very nice way, uh, but it does work. A better way is in CSS4 where we added a font dash palette. So often the, the, the font itself will have two palettes, one for use on light and one for use on dark. So you can switch between them. OK, that's fine. Uh, more interesting, though, you can have an at palette entries, which is an at rule, which lets you override the built-in palettes and provide your own one. That's better than using predefined variables and stuff. That's a nicer way. So lastly, in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about a brand new thing, variable fonts. I was at the ATIPI conference in Warsaw in September, where there was a huge announcement with many, many companies all participating to announce on the same day variable fonts. What are they? So before we start, here's a quick question just to check your CSS. So I set font weight to 400, and then I set font weight to calc 9 times 100. What is the value of font weight? Is it 400? Or is it 900? OK, shout out for 400. 
Shout out for 900. No, it's not. It's 400. Why? Because you look at that 400 and you think that's a number. It's not. It's a string. If you look in the CSS spec, unfortunately, font weight takes one of nine different strings which look like numbers. Really ugly, really horrible, right? Because of variable fonts, we're changing that back to what it should have been originally when I specified it, actually. Um, which was copied from the open, it wasn't my origination, it was just, that's what the open type spec said, and that's what we were going on. So, actually, don't worry, in CSS4, it goes back to being an actual number, between 1 and 999. You didn't know you missed this, but you will but once you start having unusual font weights yourself. So, variable fonts. We will have support for weight, for width, for slant, for optical sizing, woohoo, and the most interesting one, custom. You can have custom axes in your variable fonts. So there's a variable font. It's being animated. You can see that the weight is being animated. Also, the X height is being changed. That's a custom axis. And also, just on the thinnest ones, it's spreading it out slightly. So you've got the condensed expanded also being changed. So here's an app font face. But look now, look what's happening in those descriptors. Font weight says 100 space 900. That means it does all the weights between those numbers. Font stretch between 50%, which is condensed, and 200%, which is expanded. Font style, it goes between minus 10 degrees and 40 degrees. And here we've said we want our H1s to be oblique and at 24 degrees. And we've got our weights to be 234. Just any number between 100 and 900, it can do them all with one font. An optical sizing, none, because actually, if I was to pick the only other value, then that would be the default, so it would be pointless. So there we are, and this is how you do it. Now, unfortunately, remember I said about the old ugly things with the font settings? That's an example. That's unfortunately the only way it's implemented, but it is in Safari Technical Preview 16 Plus uh, as of about three weeks ago. So you can actually use it, but only in one browser so far, and it has to be on the latest version of OS X as well. But it's getting there. And here's an example of using it. So we're animating the weight between 0.3 and 3.1 on the axis, and the font weight will change. And you can do stupid shit like this. Um, this is basically a font that has one animatable square, and it uses that square to make the, the actual characters. And I, I said characters, you nobody booed. It uses them to make glyphs. There we go. Right. Here's another example. Notice that as you get bolder, the, the line starts merging in. So beyond a certain point, the font designer has decided to go to a different glyph with just the top and bottom and miss out the middle bit. So again, this is just an open type. This example is nice. So it gets bolder and it gets lighter, but the spacing stays the same. A little bit of adjustment to the kerning, a little bit of adjustment here to the width, and it's fitting in the same space. Now imagine that you're trying to fit a headline. You want it to be as big and bold as possible in the particular width, and you don't know what that width is, usual situation. We're using this, you can have the ultimate in responsive design. You can condense it down, basically copy fit like you would in print, so you get exactly the right font that fits the space. Quote from Jason Parmental, this made the most significant development for design in the web since responsive design itself. Variable fonts coming to you in a browser soon. If you want them, let them know. Get onto their user questions or whatever it is and request it now. People want it now. It's being worked on in CSS4. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.